I have started this video quite a few times now and I seem to get myself very sidetracked when all I want to do is try to create a cohesive time flow of events for people to follow so that they know how something started, who's involved and how it ended up at today. But as is my usual thing, sometimes I just want to explain too much that when I start to describe something, oh that's right I remember this and go off on that and then I forget what I was talking about. And then I might get to the end of the conversation and say I'm done and I never even answered half of the things that I said, oh, well, I'll get to and I'll explain that. And the trouble being too is that after I've tried to record it a few times and I've said it, it's like, have I said it in this video or the previous one? And that actually brings to mind why I wanted to create a easy to flow time, a time flow of events so that people could understand because when I first got involved with looking at Nightcap, there was very little to go on and a lot of research and digging that had to be done. And I did bring out a certain amount of information, but it, and I did a lot of guesswork. Now, a lot of the videos that I had censored, but 26 all up. I got to the stage where I realized that even ones that I had done a couple of weeks ago, some of the things that I'd said in there, I'd found out that, well, my guesswork was a little bit off or it might have been more correct, whereas where I can say something now that this happened this way, I know this, whereas back then I was guessing at something different. So in the sequence of uploading videos, I would be putting newer uploads with old information that was contradicting what I had already discovered was incorrect or correct. So that as each video I created was an attempt to bring out more information, explore the information to make sense of all of the things that were involved with it and who was involved with it and how it really started. And once all those things were considered, is there any evidence that they've done anything wrong? Is there um, any way, if they have done wrong things, to show what they have done? Now in this instance, I wasn't to know that there is an abundance of people that have been through the various Bullabula, Mount Warning Eco Village, and I kept on Minjimbul, whether they're past lost investors, previous investors, or people that just came to have a look. People had cameras, people took um, notes, they, may, they would download things at the time. And I mean, from little bits and pieces, like, you know, just obscure person that they probably wouldn't even remember came through, never bought in because they decided it wasn't for them. But they've, they've had access to certain updates because they knew someone that was associated with it who would actually send them updates because they were actually interested in getting in and they just wanted to, can I see what's going on to see if I'm interested. So all of these things went on between, well, at least hundreds of people in the Bulla Bulla days. And how many up until current times? Well, there would be still even more hundreds. So hundreds of opportunities for many individuals to obtain their own kind of perspective from the actual inside of Bulla Bulla, Mount Warning, Eco Village or Nightcap or Minjimbal. And why I say or, or, or? I will explain when I get into this story, which I haven't even started my story yet, have I? <laughs> I don't know. I've got a lot to get through too. All right, so I'm going to start the story here back in, let's say, 2010. And I'm only going to talk about Mark Darwin. 
Now, back in 2010, Mark Darwin was already running Truthology. He had a website, it was bringing out alt media articles, and was pretty much in the vein of, well, what has become known as conspiracy theorists these days. But a lot of the information that was brought out in the alt media circles was exploring different versions of events. I mean, we look at history, and history is only the common version of what we accept happened. It doesn't necessarily mean it does. And there's so many histories that we just don't have a clue of. Like, look at the Egyptian pyramids. All we can do is still guess at that. But here I am getting sidetracked. So Mark Darwin in 2010 has been running Truthology website. He's been dunning, uh, running this debt removal process to, and people would come to him to try and set up financial freedom and remove themselves of debt. He is a self-proclaimed ex-bankster. He says that um, in one video, I think it's with Lisa Harrison, that he helped establish Aussie Home Loans. And I think there's some involvement there with Wizard Homes, but there is the financial banking uh, side of it that he uses a large part of his insider knowledge to substantiate the reasoning behind his setting up of the debt processes to remove the, the, the debts and to create foundations that are legal and to set up ways to act like bankers do as an individual. Well, it didn't quite work out that way for him in reality, as we find out in the Voxes, but I'm not going to get sidetracked. So in 2010, he's doing this through Truthology. Freedom Summits has not come in yet, and he has not met, as far as I know, Adrian Brennock yet. He is still in partnership with a woman called Beatrice, who I believe they were actual partners in business and personally as well. They had a falling out, and Beatrice went and started up her own kind of debt um, and, uh, so, you know, create your own financial independence type of thing. So during the process, Mark Darwin still continues on with what he's got. There is a woman that comes to him who wants to use the debt removal processes. That woman is Stephanie Humble. I'm just going to go down here and show you Stephanie. That's Stephanie there. Oops, hang on. So in meeting Stephanie, he helped her through the debt processes and they also became involved personally. And it is at the same time, I believe a little bit after they've... Um, not sure on the time frame of when Mark Darwin and Steph got together. I know when they split up, but I don't know really on the, the exact time frame, whether it was before, after or during Adrian Brannock became involved. Because Adrian Brannock also went to Mark Darwin for getting rid of personal debts that he had to explore the debt removal processes. Now, through the course of actually talking with Mark Darwin and Adrian Brannock together, they end up becoming partners. And Adrian Brannock identifies a unique process that he uses five times to remove over, I think it's about 350000 worth of personal debt. Now, Mark Darwin talks about this a lot in his um, videos that he's got online. Now, this is leading up to where they start to format the Freedom Summits 
public um, conferences to draw in a larger audience. Now at this stage, Truthology has a membership of hundreds, maybe even thousands of people. I don't know the size that we're talking about. Probably is thousands of people that would sign up as they would to any alt media site just to see, you know, what's the next thing that you're not going to see on the news that might come out there. Now at that time, when Adrian Brennock came in, Cherie Stokes and Richard Mote, who are currently at Nightcap on Mingeable, were involved with Creator Foundation, true are Truthology members also, and they also become involved with the Freedom Summits. So what we've got here already is the baseline of the management of Bulla Bulla without Philip Dixon. But I'm not going to get into that yet because we've got to get through our story so that we can get to the end, don't we? See, it's very clear from the Voxes that Mark Darwin and Adrian Brannock are two different men and are motivated by different things. Adrian Brannock is more motivated by self-satisfaction and profit but Mark Darwin, in the instance of, uh, I think that a lot of what he was motivated to do was to share what he thought was an affront to humanity. And not only to just share that, but he also wanted to set up a way where you could act in your own independence financially, on the land, and live in an intentional community and this is where Bellingen came in in um, it's an actual town I shouldn't have put it Bellingen global awakenings because the intentional community that Mark Darwin and Stephanie Humble thought to create with Truthology members and draw them in to this intentional community of like-minded people to establish um, self-sustainability. Mark Darwin had very big ideas about farming the land and providing food, essential things first. And that was a very big focus. So in 2014, Mark Darwin had become aware of land in Bellingen. And he went there to look at it for setting up the Global Awakenings Intentional Community. And he formed a group out of people from Truthology who would want to form that community with him. And through that, there are also updates of Mark Darwin online where he goes to Bellingen long before Bulla Bulla even comes into it. He's trying to buy the land at Bellingen to set up this intentional community with a group of people that if you look over here this is the Kirkwoods family it's a wonderful video they do and it is really heartbreaking when you watch it for the first time knowing how happy they were at the prospect of setting up this kind of well, it's a dream for so many people to be able to try and achieve it. And yes, it's sad because you know the outcome. Now, we don't actually know what happened with Bellingen until Mark Darwin does a presentation at Freedom Summits for promoting the Bulla Bulla community, in which he explains that the land at Bellingen fell through. The landowner ended up not wanting to sell the land because they had so many great ideas for the use of it, he decided he'd try some of them. So here was Mark Darwin and Steph with a young family wanting to set up this intentional community. And this is a desire that comes from the heart, not from the pocketbook. You know, it's not from greed, it's from intention and they did want to find people with the same intent. 
And that's why they called it an intentional community because of the, the same intent. So but some people had actually put money into a fund to purchase the land. At this stage, Mark Darwin mentions a truthology member, Andrew Cody, Andrew and Kath, and that they had bought land recently and they'd also had their eye on some other land, but they couldn't get it and that they reckoned it would be ideal. That land was a deceased estate and it was 322 Kyogle Road, Mount Burrell and what later became known as Bulla Bulla. So in comes, hang on, Andrew Cody and Catherine. They've been to the bank, they can't get any more money but the land is ideal and he's told Mark Darwin about it. When Bellingen falls through, Mark Darwin and Andrew Cody talk, they go and have a look at the land and they decide, yes, this is good. So back and forth through various updates on video updates and posts on various Facebook and other areas, you can follow a sequence of events where they're talking to prospective people to buy in to purchase the land at Bulla Bulla. And some of the people that had already invested in the Global Awakenings Intentional Community were transferred over into the Bulla Bulla setting up community. And so here it was that Bellingen had fallen through, but they had found this land at Mount Burrell and now they can start the community there. So, Mark Darwin starts up a company, Wollumbin Dreamtime, and he also starts up another one, Organamazing. As I said, there was a desire to create a sustainable community with agriculture, farming, all of these things, functional. Then, in that capacity to go and ask for a loan from the bank, to purchase the land and the bank said don't think so Mr Darwin you know all those things you did at Freedom Summits where you told people to not pay their bills and how to screw over the banks don't think we're going to lend you any money so that's where Mark Darwin was in a bit of a pickle they've got the land they've got the investors but all they need now is someone that could borrow the money so he turns to his partner, Adrian Brannock, and he asks him, will he borrow the money? He says, yep. So he sets up a London, Adrian Brannock sets up a London Horizons Proprietary Limited to purchase the land of Bulla Bulla. Now, the rest of it is a lot to do with liquidation and companies that I'm not actually going to get in here into here because there's a whole other paper and financial side of the trail that is beyond the people and understanding how the story all fits together so I'm not going to get sidetracked with that so let's just keep going with we've got to Bulla Bulla, Adrian Brannock has said, yes, I will do it. Wollumbin Horizons is set up. And in June 2015, the land is purchased. But driving that purchase on um, the Wayback Machine, you can find uh, screen captures. This one's from March 2015. They didn't buy the land until June. So by March 2015, the Bulla Bulla community had already set up the steering committee and it consists of these people. I don't know who George and Sue are, I can tell you all these others, but I will show you the way back machine image in a minute so that uh, you can see it for yourself. So even then, before they've bought the land at 322 Kyogle Road, which becomes Bulla Bulla, part of the whole purpose 
of every enterprise associated with the land and establishing the community has always been tied around the Mount Burrell Commercial District and owning that and bringing profits back to the community. It was always part of the promise to every investor since Bulla Bulla first became part of it because the property, the business came up for sale at the same time the deceased estate did. So it's a logical conclusion that if you can get the money, it can provide a source of income for the community. And if it was run properly, it would be a profit maker instead of a money drain. But that's a different subject. Let's get back to Bulla Bulla. So those images of the um, steering committee come from the Wayback Machine. It dates the image too. You can see the exact position 27th of March 2015. There are three captures and those three captures look like this. You can access any of those three. Where's the other one? Am I going blind? <laughs> Must be, Oh, there. So you can look at what the web capture was on that day. Sometimes when they capture a website, they might actually copy just the front page. Other times they might copy the front page and one page deeper. So really when you've got um, every web capture may give you something a little bit different. But there are three websites associated with the Bulla Bulla community. The original one that was set up was in March 2015. This one here, the Bulla Bulla Org one, whereas this one is Bulla Bulla Community. The next one was Bulla Bulla Org. Those web captures start from June 2016. So that was more after the Voxes when things started to go wrong and they were trying to move things in a different direction. Or it just could have been the first time, it could have been started a year later, a year before, and there was never a web capture. Because a lot of these things are just done by a web crawler that just captures images of pages. So that's those two pages. Then there's this one that's actually a current web page. And this is Bulla Bulla Weebly, my community. You actually do voting on this page. When they talk about voting, um, Gillian Norman off and other things like that, voting for the different things, this is where you go in for it. Where they tell you to go online and vote, this is where you would be submitting it, or this was how it was supposed to be created. Now apparently I can't remember whether it was Nicole uh, Standen or Robin Bourne from uh, Noble Law that created this website. Then you've got other things. I mean, there's lots of different headings on this one. Cattle livestock. It was always part of um, Bulla Bulla to have cattle. And the thing being that in 2019, Tyler Tolman made specific mention that cattle, nothing would be slaughtered on site. And it's like, well, duh, you've got to have a slaughterhouse for that. Usually they go off in a truck to a slaughterhouse. You know, it's a one-way trip. They graze on the land and you give them their last farewell. But why was he making a point that they would not be slaughtered there? Because it must have been part of what was being promoted that there would be cattle. So cattle has always been a part of what was promoted at Bulla Bulla through into Mount Warning Eco Village, etc. on the night cap on Minjimble. Uh, what they intend to do with the cattle now, well, that could actually be a video in itself. So I'm not going to get sidetracked with that. Now one thing I will get sidetracked with here is this multiple occupancy council applications and development approvals. Now essentially the thing that has been promised for since 2015, probably 2014, is that there will be more than a draft agreement 
that you there will be something legal there will be financials there will be full disclosure to investors on how when and what the money was spent on and who authorized them to actually spend that was it actually in the best interests of the investors use of money uh, I mean essentially they are acting as trustees of the investors money the company in CV Enterprises whoever accepts their money is acting as the trustee of their interests that's the way I look at it anyway but here we are back in 2015 we're looking at council applications and development approvals now at the end of 2015 it had become abundantly clear that they were going to have issues getting DA consent Daryl Anderson Consulting had been involved with um, trying to achieve approval and he had brought up the water catchment issue and other limitations that would mean that really what they wanted to achieve on a much smaller scale than the current nightcap was unachievable. Now they didn't agree with Dale Anderson's take on how it was impossible so that's how they ended up with Planet um, Consulting because he was a yes man can do it doesn't matter whether it's legal yes if you want to create pink fairies on the top of a castle we'll build that for you we no judgment here we'll argue your point of view even if we don't believe in it we're going to get paid either way at the end of the day now consider that in 2015 um, there are drafts still drafts they're promising the financials you'll get them uh, soon soon you'll have more than drafts well actually you will have a draft but we will fi finalize the draft to a legal position soon and we will get the financials soon when 2000 in 2020 in May 2020 when the official nightcap on Minjimbal video was done Adrian Bronock representing nightcap on Minjimbal said that they've had five years to consider all these issues five years to turn a draft into a legal document and they haven't what is their problem it's now six years and they're still promising investors draft documents they submitted draft documents with the DA all they ever do is give draft documents it's very hard to draft a legal document that appears to give people rights but doesn't actually give them any and that's why it is still a draft document after six years any investor that's bought in under a draft document please I hope that you don't have to try and prove your legal position in court you will find that the court thinks that that piece of paper that you think has your rights protected on it that they said no even though it's a draft it's still still legal oh dear the judge will disagree it is there's actually a precedent set in the liquidation of Lumbran Horizons and trying to determine the rights of those investors that had paid in to purchase the land the judge had a difficult position because there was no legal document that he could use he had to try and decide what kind of trust situations were being used and it applied in three different manners simply because did you buy in to buy the land that was Bulla Bulla before to, to June 2015 or did you buy in to pay off the mortgage that was taken out to buy the land or did you buy in after the mortgage was paid off there were three different ways that the judge had to reflect on considering all the people that had bought in simply under what condition that they had bought in on whether the land had already been owned whether they were paying off the mortgage or whether the mortgage had been paid off 
and whether it could be intended after you were bought in, after the mortgage and the land had been paid off, that your income would go towards community upkeep. So every way that people had thought that this one piece of paper had given them some kind of legal standing, the court really had a completely different look on it. And this was back in 2015, draft after draft after draft. As Adrian Brenock said, in 2020, they have had five years to look at every issue. And with all that time, with all that money spent on legal advice, and all these, probably what amounts to hundreds of drafts that they've done right now, why is it that they cannot produce something that is right, bang, boom, here's a legal document, it can be lodged, it can be recognised, and it's valid. It's legal. Why can they not produce that after six years? And after six years, don't you think that they should be able to keep track of financial records a lot better, especially after the judges told them that their treatment of the financials, well, it was below incompetent. The judgment against them was not that good and yet they put it on their website and promote it and wave it around and go, look, we haven't done anything wrong because Gillian Norman stuffed up her case and lost and we win. Well, so what? You know what? Judgments can be overturned. Fair enough, she can't overturn contempt of court but an interesting thing has happened in August this year, besides what just recently went on with the panel. On, I think it was the 11th of August, uh, 2021, Gillian Norman was taken to court for sentencing over her contempt of court in the case against um, Adrian Brannock and Philip Dixon. On that day, the judge said that he would need to review sentencing because the, um, Adrian Brannock and Philip Dixon had requested that she go to jail. And the judge was considering making an example of Gillian Norman and that he would re-adjourn on the 20th of August, which I think is tomorrow, and deliver his judgment on sentencing. Now, the interesting thing that happened on the 11th of August besides that was this new thing on Nightcap's website. Special skill search price of only 299000 until 31st of August 2021. When I noticed that, it's the 11th of August. On the 18th of August, which was yesterday, Wednesday at 3 p.m., the planning panel met and made a decision on DA 21-0010. And you unanimously, see, I was so excited I couldn't get it out quick enough, unanimously refused the DA. So here they are with no DA advertising for special skill search price of only 299 should be cents. Your special skills aren't going to be worth anything because there's no way that the flimsy argument that Andrew Goff came up with for so many things to say, no, that, yes, it, it, it might seem illegal, but it's not actually illegal. If you look at it this way and you say this, because that's the way I interpret it, <laughs> it's, uh, okay, yeah, it, it actually was sort of a bit of a deflation after so long of wondering how they would explain all these breaches within the state environmental planning policy would actually turn out to be legal? How could you describe breaches 
clear breaches and say that no 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 they're legal we've got a way to explain it so that it is legal i mean it you know it might be illegal for everybody else but the, they don't know how to explain it the way that we do now before i go too far into the crossover here into nightcap let's go back briefly to bulla bulla and what was set up in 2015 and 2016. I haven't actually checked the other one on the Wayback Machine to see an idea of then. But here we have June and July that they were set up. Now, these are clearly accessing um, images that were somewhere else but have now been deleted. So all they've been left with is that. But when this website was set up, I'll just see if I can bring up the time flow. Okay, this time flow is a little bit messy, but starting to put events more in sequential order. That up here is Bulla Bulla. It started in 2015. Over here, the investors of NICAP are said to start buying in on the 1st of June 2015 with 600000 with Rainmaker Group Holdings. At the same time in June, investors thought they had enough money because of all of them that are bought in. They'd added up what they bought in and said, well, we should have enough. And they said, no, you don't. That's why Adrian Brennock was asked to borrow the money. So the 600 odd thousand that they thought that they had to own the land outright, that they said, no, nah, no, nah, that's gone, suddenly shows up over here at the foundation of Nightcap. See, that was put over into the Mount Burrell commercial area to purchase that, to bring that into the community as has been the desire all along. So investors' money, these 600000 I say came from over here with the Buller Buller investors that when they thought they had the money to buy the land outright and they AB and Mark Darwin said no you don't we need to borrow it there was the 600,000 over here sitting and waiting to take major shares in the commercial area and control over it and purchase the Mount Burrell commercial area which wasn't done until the end of 2015 or uh, it might have even been a little bit further on actually I'm not sure on that one I think it might have even been the end of 2016 but anyway here the Voxes covers this time frame but while there is Bulla Bulla and the Bulla Bulla websites then you have here in September 2016 that Adrian Brennock's property in um, Helensvale, I think it was, he hadn't paid, he took out a mortgage and didn't pay it. And then tried to claim sovereignty, tribal right over it. He ended up being taken to court and the start of that action was in 2015, which was up here. And here was the enforcement warrant where he lost his house worth over you know something like 1.2 or something million dollars and whether he owed any money or not i don't know but already the vo in the voxes we can hear that the ato is pursuing him and they end up bankrupting adrian brennock um over i dare say outstanding taxes so while all this is going on and in the investors it's clear that the company is going into liquidation they're putting money on the other side to start up mount warning eco village to rebrand from bulla bulla to detach wollumban horizons and put that into liquidation and to move it on forward through mount warning eco village so all the same people are involved that were involved in bulla bulla and so was the money from Bulla Bulla investors involved in the creation of buying the Mount Burrell commercial area that is part of the Mount Warning Eco Village. 
So these are only distinctions in the website. Now, on the, um, I'll just show you here, hang on. Now, if you look here, you see that, oh, you can't see it, it's just off the screen. All right, so I'll copy the link address and I'll do it again. You go in and you just paste it. Anything that goes to a WordPress, WordPress site, some of them actually allow you to go into the index. So, well, let's take it back to 2021 and just take that out. And sometimes it will come up 404 forbidden, but other times it will come up like this. And it will give you all the information. So you know when the website was started with basic photos and information, nothing filled in. You can see here when the Mount Warning Eco Village logo was put in in December. So all of these dates, using this information from their actual website, there has been the three rebrandings, which has been through Mount Warning Eco Village, then Nightcap on Mingimble, Nightcap on Mingimble with B A L, and then down here in May 2020 with Nightcap on Mingimble B U L. So essentially as particular events have happened they've tried to rebrand and just here in May 2020 they were looking at moving forward at purchasing um, 3222 back through NCV Enterprises which AB is a shareholder of through putting Nyepi into his wife's name during bankruptcy it's a phoenix manoeuvre deliberately released all the old dead wood that was, and the debts, bought the land back and is now selling them off to an, the same thing. Again, with the same people, except Mark Darwin. Mark Darwin leaves on the 23rd of August, just before AB becomes bankrupt and about a week after AB tries to get his bankruptcy notice set aside and it is dismissed and he fails. He's going to be made bankrupt. And so you can't borrow any more money, can you, AB? And I think Mark Darwin's smart enough to realise that AB's in it for the money and he can't create the intentional community. So if you go over here too, interesting insertion here that the commercial area went into receiver managership for a month. During that month, shares were a great infusion of money came in through Matthew Perryman and High Fusion. And uh, I'm not sure where the foundation and other ones came in at the time. But this is where you should be asking Derek Zillman about how much money is actually owed. Not how much money things are going to cost to do, but how much is already owed. There might not be any mortgage over the land, but that does not mean that money is not owed to people that have, are holding shares in Mount Burrell Commercial as security for the loan that they gave to pull Mount Burrell Commercial out of manager. An interesting story can actually be told about the movement of um, shares between certain companies and particular people associated with them since 2018 and also the confirmation through updates that a second mortgage is involved. So if there's a second mortgage that means there's a first mortgage which means how much money is actually owed. So that would be a question that investors would actually be wanting to look at right now with the failure of the DA to get any approval to be totally refused. And it was um, the developer's desire to take this 
to the um, state level because they were convinced that they could talk the state government into, I don't know, pretending laws didn't exist. I don't. That's why there were so many interesting things that came out yesterday, which we haven't even got to yesterday and fully talking about that. Because it, it's... My little time scale ends here a bit, but um, hang on. So yesterday, 3 p.m., people started uh, logging on um, to the video conference meeting by the regional planning panel to hear the application by Nightcap on Minjimbal for multiple rural land sharing communities. And it was really, in some places, oh, I'm glad they had mute because I <laughs> don't think Andrew Goff would have liked what I said to him. Oh, he's an idiot. Sorry, mate. But, you know, seriously, um, I could get kindergarten kids to come up with better arguments than, well, that's the way because I think it and that's the way I interpret it. It's like, just because you think it doesn't... <laughs> oh, dear. The way that... Well, until the regional planning panel meeting yesterday, there were so many questions that couldn't be answered. You know, Derek Zillman had been saying for so long that, oh, that, that you know, you've got that all wrong. They're not illegal. We're going to get approval. It's like, how are you going to get approval? How are you going to get around this? Oh, we've got it all sorted out, you know. We've got expert advice that's told us this, that and the other. <laughs> yeah, sure you do, mate. Well, what did your expert, uh, your expert get out of it? Tell you what, he got a nice big fat payment check. What did you get? You got someone to talk your bullshit and got paid for it? They don't care whether you win or lose. And that's where you've got to go to businesses that actually care about the quality of work and the quality of information. They're not just going to spin any type of bullshit that the customer pays them to sell. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, you know. But uh, the panel did a marvellous job of dealing with all the issues that were raised. It was difficult, I think, for everybody to actually understand how it was set out that it appeared that the panel was going to look at the council's assessment to reject it and that the the 10 points for rejecting it and that the applicant would get a chance to respond to those objections to basically you know say that illegal's legal and that they could do it which they did try to <laughs> explain. And the um, council also said, submitted everything that the, was forming part of DA 21-0010 to the panel, along with the 225 public submissions that they received. And the panel has reviewed all of this before coming forward at the meeting to look at the 10 reasons that the council, major reasons the council has assessed rejection of the proposal, the development application. And during the meeting, they asked a lot of questions to find clarity on certain issues. And during the whole time of watching this um, meeting and seeing what was being put forward by both the council and the applicant and also the public that spoke, there were some good arguments that were actually put forward by council. Um, I wouldn't say arguments, i just say that people talking common sense the very noticeable difference was the applicant being represented by a rather, um, 
obvious selling too hard lawyer that well I don't know I think does he have a little bit too much confidence in himself I mean he clearly had enough confidence in himself to turn around to his client and say yeah no problems there's all that illegal stuff that's in there we can find ways to argue it look I'll just come up with any rubbish excuse because if you can argue that it's your perspective and you can get someone to see that it's your perspective and argue it from away and you know confuse their mind so much they'll, they'll, they'll agree with you just to because you must know what you're talking about they don't know what you're talking about well you see is where I give it to the panel um, intelligent people ask a lot of good questions examine the information and after two and a half hours of listening and um, the best person that they actually had speak for the applicant was the guy on the ecology part of it Dr Robinson he was actually their best witness as far as supporting anything that they were saying simply because he was the most honest and some of the things that he was actually supporting that were contrary to what other people would think um, was simply because that was his personal opinion even though he was an expert in well he called himself an expert in certain areas well probably calls himself a doctor for that reason but um yeah but the past part where dr robinson lost me was when he was trying to argue that the current recognized corridor pretty much you know well it's only recognized because no one's done a better study and it's not really recognized and in my opinion you know because it was done under this that or the other it's like come on it is the accepted wildlife corridor so there were a few things that you know he said that it was clear that that was his personal perspective and that that's probably why they chose him as an expert because he he was actually their better expert that did appear for them I mean their town planner seriously if you want to go to sleep just put him on I mean he tells such a fairy tale you'll be off in dreamland before you know it and when it comes to um, <laughs> Andrew Goff well I think watching all his body language and the faces he pulls and how he bites his lip and he starts to frown and he start rubbing his his brow and even there at one stage it looks like oh it looks like your expert witness said the wrong thing and that's that's raised your stress levels but you can't show that can you <laughs> yeah see they all of this stuff comes out and when you look at um Lindsay McGavin over here from the Tweedshire Council is just sitting there talking about what he knows he's not trying to bullshit someone and describe something that you know up is down and in is out and all this other rubbish he's just giving it to you straight telling you how it is and that is the difference between all the particular people that appeared even their fire expert for the applicant oh my goodness that was actually the worst expert I could get a kid from kindergarten to come out and be a better expert than that did you know that your fire expert actually brought up an image that goes back to Rainmaker Eco Investments it's actually on there on this recording he brings up a map of and over in the corner is Rainmaker Eco Investments. Now, Rainmaker e Eco Investments was previously Freedom Summit's ethical investments and was tied up with Freedom Summit's truthology and everything like that and goes back to Bulla Bulla days. So, here is your fire expert for Nightcap on Mingimble bringing up documentation that comes via Bulla Bulla. And you're trying to tell us that it's different when it's so many cases you can't even distinguish the information because you're still using the same experts you used at Bulla Bulla as you are at Nightcap. There you go, a little image of it. 
Here is uh, the second entrance. This is where they want to set up the uh, side office and sheds. Over here is a hundred tents. And look over here is Rainmaker Eco Investments. So this, this here puts it back to Bulla Bulla. And that's by your own documents that Nightcap on Minjimbo are presenting through their own experts that are still dealing with the same people, the same documentations, except this simple man hasn't updated any of his information. That should read NCV Enterprises, shouldn't it? Not Rainmaker Eco Investments. But I suppose, you know, you get what you get when you, uh, look, you just got to watch the meeting to find their expert. What's his name? Um, Mr. Hassel, oh, hang on. Wayne Hathaway. With, I think, <laughs> as soon as he started talking, he reminded me of Dolph Cook. Because, you know, there's one thing that I was always taught, that if you're going to speak, be understood, speak clearly, and speak the language everybody else speaks. And there's one thing that I can't abide by is people that that are too lazy to speak properly when they say with or uh, think. I mean, what's a think? Oh, you think something? Is it, Do you mean think? Oh, no, no, come on. Now let's say th, not th, not as in the furry, it's the, as in the. Do you say the for the? Come on. So it's laziness as far as I'm concerned. Lazy mind that goes with lazy speech. So basically, you, know, you haven't got such a very big thinker when you can't speak properly. So I think you get what you get with someone like Wayne <laughs> because, well, that's, that's, there we go. There's, that's Wayne down there presenting his image. The only image through the whole thing, the only document that anybody presented. Could have shown a few more, Wayne. Would they have had Rainmaker Eco Investments on there? thing being too here is that the example he showed of the buffer zones that he created, it's like, what did you create, mate? There's the road. You've put orange lines around the road and you've put orange lines up the, up the boundary properties there and said, that thick line is the border zone and there you go, I've created these fire zones. <laughs> really? How, um, so when the fire comes along those lines on this map are going to make a big difference aren't they so everyone was very surprised yesterday when they adjourned after two and a half hours and said that they would come back with a decision I mean very excited we were going to find out and coming back at 6.30 when they said they'd come back and it's like no they're still in uh, let's come back at 6.45. Nelly missed it. Back at 6.45, just in time for the chairman to come back on and saying we've reached a decision, it's unanimous, and we have refused the application. And, oh, so many people cheered. <laughs> a lot of celebrating going on last night. But it's also the beginning of certain things too. There's a lot that still has to come out, that has to change and move forward. This is only, well, proof that so many people have been saying for so long that everything they're trying to achieve is going against the community, against the law. They want to set themselves up apart from the system, say that they will abide by the laws of the matrix and yet give them the big finger up and say, I don't care how many laws we break. 
There's always going to be a way. We can pay a lawyer to argue around it and we're going to win. Maybe that worked in the past. Thank you, Northern Regional Planning Panel. You made a very good decision. Thank you, Tweed Shire Council. Thank you to the 225 people who put in a submission in the public period against the DA. And every single submission the council received was against this development. Not one single person bothered to put in a public submission for any kind of support. So there was nothing for the council to look at that the public supported this in any way, shape or form. Because the people that have been made all the promises that would support this believe that they don't need to look after that because they've been made the promises by the upper management team. They're going to get what they're going to get. You know, other people might lose out, but they won't because they'll bounce back even if the worst case happens and they don't get the DA. Well, the thing is, the DA has failed. What now? What happens to all the people that are invested in Nightcap on Minjimbal? The Mount Burrell commercial area is virtually shut down anyway. The caravan part, park has been demolished. That still has to have a DA put through and has to be reconstructed. That's at cost on top of everything else. The viable businesses that were there paying lease money each, rent money each month, well now you've got one shop that is run by a member of the community. And, well, we won't get into that, what that member might be up to, is Tony McMurtry and Mark McMurtry are very well known by some people out there. And that's a different story altogether, isn't it? That's part of Mark McMurtry's trip to um, the OSTF um, tribal aspect of things and the Brobus tour and all of these things that go back to uh, what a tribal fake Mark McMurtry is. And essentially what a fake the tribe that is set up at Nightcap on Minjimbo is too. I'll call them out as a complete and utter fake. There are so many others out there that have already called them out. There are people that have called out all these things that have been fake, that they can't achieve. They are promising you things they cannot deliver. Now take a good look at this picture over here that says... Epic fail, fail, denied, rejected. Common sense. This is where a lot of what I say has come from and what other people see is common sense. The common sense of things says that if you've got 10 things on a list that says that they're illegal when you know, it's half the list of things that you've got to get right, but those 10 things are really big things. Each one of those is enough to lose you getting a pass. You know, but 10 of them? It's only common sense that the only way that you could achieve approval on, like, on something like that is if you actually found a corrupt official and you bribed them. So... The planning panel over here cannot act legally and honourably and give consent to this development. And their ruling proved that. That the processes do work. And for what they'd say about the system being against people, no. Not every time. In this instance, the system worked for the people. The majority of people. 225 people that stood up and said no you cannot do this this is just wrong way over the top way out of the ballpark you can't go building a city in the country it's just wrong 
and especially over wildlife corridors in major wilderness conservation areas. I mean, do you people, and then to turn around and say, you know what our greatest philosophy is? Our first principle is, do no harm. Oh, well, I certainly hope they choke on those do no harm words, because if they want to lie and say that what they want to do will cause no harm, well then let it be that they will be rejected, denied, claim denied, epic fail. They will not be able to achieve what they dream of. They dream of ignoring the existing laws that everybody else has to live by. And yet on the other hand claim we are fulfilling every legal standard. Again, that's been a claim over the years. It's all talk. Like for six years, after all the draft agreements, why is this still a draft? I would actually say, you know what? After six years and how many tries and you still can't get it right? Guess what? I don't think you can ever get it right. You're only ever going to produce a draft. And if you have no clue how to keep proper financial records to inform investors on how you're spending their money, if you didn't know how to do it six years ago and you don't know how to do it now, again, I'd ask, do you even have the capacity to be able to do that? Or is it the fact of how you try and get through to a certain stage with out telling people how you're spending their money. Then when they start saying, we want to know, you've got to try and make it look so that it matches your narrative. And that's where you get manufactured account records, records with pages missing, things that don't balance and confusion. And it's by design. That's why six years ago there was no financial proper record keeping and that's why today you should be as an investor of Nightcap be able to turn around and say I'd like to see the financial sit financial report. Boom, there it is. Right there. You know exactly what's going on. Because after six years of considering every issue we've got it right and we know exactly what we're doing. No, after six years, you're still doing the same thing. And after six years, people actually think that those things that have failed in the past, by doing those same things now, they will actually succeed. Well, the definition of insanity is to repeat the same things and expect a different result. So if you want to expect a different result, than what the investors at Bulla Bulla got? You've done the same thing. How will you get a different result? And on that note, I'm gonna leave it till the next in depth. Might dive into the companies and what's been going on with them because, well, it is warming up, I think, for another fire sale. It won't be Wollumbin Horizons this time. Hmm, and I wonder what they will rebrand to this time. And then they'll say, oh, it's not the same development. It's a completely different name. Look, completely different name, completely different logo, and yet it's not the same. Different. <laughs> uh, not at all. Even though they'll continue to go on trying selling Yes, the land, the commercial, the same. We're going to build a village. We're going to build these services and all this, that and the other. Again, the stories that they are telling now were told six years ago. The only thing that's changed is that more people have actually become aware that they are fairy stories. And it is creating an epic fail. An epic fail for those that have tried to make money out of selling, um, well, the majority of land they don't even own yet. 
And until they purchased the land through NCV Enterprises at the liquidation sale, they didn't even own any assets other than the commercial, which they've run into the ground, shut down all the shops virtually. <laughs> and they've got no caravan park. That's going to come at a cost. Anything is going to cost money. On top of how much is owed in the first mortgage or the second mortgage or even other mortgages that came after that. Maybe we should ask Judith and Mortgage Select what they've got to do with it. Hmm. And maybe we would ask Judith, well, you're in financing, Derek Zillman's in financing. You seem to be uh, coming from the same circles too. Um, yeah. Do you actually think that you're going to end up taking the land and getting rid of all the investors so that, I don't know, what is going to be the ultimate outcome? There is no DA. You're not going to get a DA. Even if now that you put in separate DAs for all those lots to try and achieve a singular rural land sharing community on, the Tweechai Council is already in the process of removing themselves from the state environmental planning policy. It is only a matter of time before they will not be allowed at all. So out of all the ones that you might plan, you might even be lucky if you were able to submit one DA for it. But then it will bring into question too the history of what's been involved. That's why DA 06 1054 was brought in to it because there was previously that DA that was associated with the current DA. So it was given as a historical context. So nothing that comes now with any of those lots on the land is ever going to remove itself from Peter Van Leishout's original DA's. 06-1054 or now Nightcap's DA um, to uh, 21-0010. So any of the lots that are involved with that, anyone wants to do anything in the future, that will come up as historical information and that will be considered in the assessment of any future applications. So yeah, I don't think that the chances of establishing anything uh, as far as rural land sharing communities is acceptable within the Tweed Chai Council. You'd have to look at separate um, title ownership and how you would divide that amongst the, the current investors. But that's considering that you actually continue to purchase the 16 lots off Peter Van Leishout but by the end of next year, I think it is, or where, whenever. So you still need to come up with, what, maybe $7 million to finish that sale off so that the investors that you've actually currently got might have some land to divide amongst themselves and perhaps try and find some way to get some share of legal title in. Anyway, I said I was going to leave it and I haven't. <laughs> I'm going to leave it now. <laughs> Talk to you next time. Bye.